When testosterone made the cover of Time magazine a few years ago, the writer was careful to say the main potential danger of testosterone replacement therapy is the effect on the prostate gland, and it is this potential danger that this study was designed to address. Uh, despite many years of concern, testosterone replacement therapy may not carry the risks to the prostate commonly believed. With synthetic testosterone now readily available, many doctors quickly embraced the use of the hormone to treat the male climacteric, as it was uh, referred to in this early paper. We now call this late onset hypogonadism. Uh, one of the early publications on this topic is shown right here, and it happens to be from JAMA in 1944. These authors observed that satisfactory results were obtained by intramuscular injections of testosterone. This condition, which may be, you may see referred to as andropause, uh, male climacteric, male menopause, viral pause, or ADAM, androgen decline of the aging male, uh, may be defined this way. It's the clinical reflection of an age-related decline in testosterone seen in up to 50% of men in the last third of life, it may be considered a physiologic extreme of the male aging process. The onset is insidious, gradually progressive, and most often recognized in the fifth or sixth decade of life. Its manifestations are a decline in bodily function normally maintained by testosterone, that is, libido, potency, mood, intellect, and also bone, muscle, and lean body mass. The treatment is testosterone replacement. Testosterone replacement therapy has many potential benefits, including its effects on libido, erectile function, energy, well-being, muscle mass, and the rest. But there are also potential concerns with testosterone replacement therapy, and the number one concern is the potential effect on the prostate, uh, which could be the most serious of all of these. At about the same time that testosterone was being introduced as a therapy for andropause, uh, Charles Huggins, shown here at the University of Chicago, showed that men with advanced prostate cancer could actually have their disease put into remission by eliminating testosterone. For this work, another Nobel Prize was awarded. But what about the flip side of this? What happens to the prostate when men are given replacement therapy or exogenous testosterone. Actually, in men with advanced prostate cancer, a little bit of information is available, and clearly giving testosterone to men with advanced prostate cancer is detrimental. Uh, uh, there, uh, this kind of work was done in various clinical trials here in New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, in gents like this with bone, metastatic bone disease. The results are generally unfavorable. Of uh, 52 men uh, gathered over a, a several uh, decades uh, years ago, when these men received testosterone, pain increased, nausea and vomiting increased, uh, metastases increased, there were even deaths. So clearly it's contraindicated in advanced prostate cancer. In fact, the director of the National Cancer Institute, uh, Andrew von Eschenbach, America's number one cancer doctor, told the New York Times recently, recognizing the dependency of prostate cancer on testosterone, I am not convinced there's enough evidence on its safety to justify widespread use. To help determine just what testosterone does to the prostate, we designed our clinical trial. Our hypothesis was simply that exogenous testosterone enters the prostate, is converted there to dihydrotestosterone, the active metabolite within the, the gland, and affects biological change there. We thought it remarkable that even in the early years of the 21st century, basic information like this was not available. Our study participants were older men 
with low testosterone levels, symptoms referable to low testosterone levels, and no prostate cancer on a screening biopsy with PSAs less than 10. We didn't want to risk giving this to anyone with cancer at this early stage. The trial was a randomized trial of six months duration, and all men in this trial underwent biopsy at baseline. This was uh, the unique aspects of this study, was that we studied prostate tissues directly, uh, while others before us had studied gross measures of the prostate, like changes in size or indirect measures such as serum PSA levels. Uh, thus, all men had biopsy at baseline and then were randomized to receive either testosterone replacement therapy or placebo for six months and then underwent rebiopsy at the end of the study. Uh, the first thing we found in these 41 men who completed the trial was that cancer was not increased at the microscopic level. Two cancers were found on biopsy in this group at conclusion, that's the testosterone treated men and four in the placebo group, so actually uh, four, uh, more men from placebo were found to have cancer than in the prostatic, uh, than in the testosterone group. So clearly this medicine, the testosterone replacement therapy, was not stimulating the development of new cancers, uh, and these cancers were approximately equal in severity in the two groups. It's also interesting to realize very likely these six cancers were there from the beginning. We also wanted to look at the fundamental biology of the prostate, and that's really what this was developed the study was designed for. So the prostate biopsies taken here, and these are what these little cores actually look like, they were then harvested first for chemical study uh, of the uh, hormones, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. They were harvested for detailed microscopic evaluation and also for changes in gene expression. Gene is the fundamental unit of biology, and our theory was that if no change in gene expression was present, then certainly uh, we must not be affecting the tissues. Placebo men are in uh, the white boxes, and the active or testosterone-treated men in the gray boxes. First baseline, and then the six-month level uh, testosterone shown here, and dihydrotestosterone shown here. And the first thing noted is that in serum, these are all serum now, uh, there was a expected increase to the mid-normal range for serum testosterone levels, and dihydrotestosterone also increases a statistically significant uh, fashion. However, in tissue, in prostate tissue, the testosterone and the dihydrotestosterone levels don't change. Uh, they remain essentially the same as at baseline. So just to reemphasize this point, the expected increase in serum levels of these hormones from the replacement therapy we were administering, but no change in tissue hormone levels. Supporting the chemical data were these tissue measures all done by experts in a blinded fashion. There was no treatment related change in atrophy, that is cell shrinkage, or growth, or inflammation, or cancers as we've shown before, and nor was there any change in cellular composition. We also looked at detailed studies of the tissue biomarkers for cell proliferation, that is how rapidly the cells are turning over. We looked at the androgen receptor, which tells how the hormones bind to the, uh, to the tissue. And we looked at angiogenesis markers, that has to do with small vessel ingrowth, uh, important in uh, malignancy no change in any of these parameters studied. And very importantly, there were also no significant changes in gene expression. A microarray, a gene microarray was created from prostate glandular cells and there was no treatment related change in gene expression seen. We looked at particularly at genes known to be androgen regulated and four of them are shown here. No treatment effect on androgen regulated genes and the same was noted for these two cancer related genes. Uh, thus the genetic studies from this project support the tissue studies uh, and the hormone changes. Uh, no effect uh, in these, uh, in these patients. Normalization of serum testosterone for six months resulted in no change in prostatic levels of androgens, histology, biomarkers, gene expression, or cancer frequency or severity. We conclude that the prostate risks from testosterone replacement therapy of six months duration may not be as great as once feared. However, 
caution here. These data do not assure prostate safety for populations of older men harboring highly prevalent subclinical disease. We know that if you do uh, thorough studies of the prostate glands of aging men, microscopic foci of cancer are present in many of them that do not seem to be clinically significant. This doesn't guarantee that some effect won't be uh, seen when uh, entire populations of men are studied for safety, but this would require a much bigger, much longer study in the individual patient, especially with a negative biopsy at baseline, the risk appears to be quite small. A degree of prostate safety for men undergoing testosterone replacement therapy is established. Hopefully this finding won't lead to abusive widespread application of this finding. From a laboratory standpoint, again, the fallibility of the PSA test for prostate cancer is shown. Um, this supports a, an emerging body of thought to show that PSA levels are not great markers for prostate cancer, best we've got at the moment, but they are fallible because of the men in this uh, study who were found to have cancer on biopsy, only one had a PSA level greater than four, which is the usual, usual trigger point for prostate biopsy. With regard to the basic physiology of the prostate gland, it's interesting that the tissue levels within the prostate of the male hormones don't change despite a wide range of circulating levels in the serum, in the bath surrounding uh, the prostate, bathing the prostate. There seems to be a buffering mechanism in effect protecting the gland uh, from a very wide range of circulating hormones. Now, how this buffering mechanism is established and how it breaks down uh, in extremes, such as uh, in castration or in supranormal dosages of testosterone, that information is not uh, is not yet available. I want to conclude by acknowledging the great contributions to this project from these fine medical scientists. Uh, and finally, thanks uh, very much once again to Dr. DeAngelis and uh, Dr. Fontenarose and their fine staff at JAMA, who helped make this article coherent. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you're pointing out a major limitation of this study. It was only of six months duration. This is a start. Um, I, uh, I think what you've got to realize about this particular study is that it was a biopsy study, and the 44 men in this study gave two biopsies for science. We were uh, uh, glad to have that six months of follow-up. I think you're right. I think we need to know the, lo the long haul. I think you're right. I think IGF-1 is one of the most interesting of the genes currently being looked at. Uh, these six genes were the ones that we did quantitative uh, RT-PCR on to, to determine their quantitative. They, they fell out of a, um, they were selected out of a gene microarray of, for hundreds of prostate genes, prostate relevant genes that were all looked at. Um, so you screened them. Yes. Yes, a microarray, a complete gene microarray was created. Hundreds and hundreds of genes were looked at. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That is a concern of mine. Um, it is estimated that about 5 million American men would be candidates for testosterone replacement therapy. The NIH actually hired the Institute of Medicine to look into this for them a few years ago. And a, a, a blue ribbon panel of the Institute of Medicine was convened and recommended, this was published last year, that um, <clears throat> focused efficacy trials should be done first. Small focused efficacy trials should be done first to be sure that the benefits were, uh, were conclusive before spending $100 million of the taxpayers' money to fund a, uh, a, the 6,000-man trial. So that's, the, that's where we are right now. I do agree there is a, a concern that, that some physicians may, may misinterpret these data and start using uh, testosterone willy-nilly. And, uh, and the, I, the, my hope is that it won't be used that way. There are some limitations on how much you can generalize from this project.